so crypto 2.0. So first of all, why do I like using that term? And instead of you know using something like the Bitcoin space or the blockchain space or smart or blockchain, you know, it's like using using blockchain kind of like a mass noun. It's like, oh, you know, we are using boat in order to ship products from Singapore to Canada. So it's not just about Bitcoin, it's not just about blockchain, it's not even just about Ethereum. It's about the combination of you know, decentralized cryptographic technologies that can minimize trust, it can improve freedom, improve cooperation, and improve efficiency in very many areas of our lives. And this includes a combination of uh, blockchain-based systems, it includes a combination of other kinds of decentralized platforms, it includes so even platforms that are centralized but still use similar technologies in order to increase their levels, levels of uh, authenticity, verifiability, cryptographic trust, zero-knowledge proofs, distributed hash tables, lots of wonderful technological buzzwords that I'm hoping five to ten years from now will end up being uh, the fabric of large, portion, large portions of society in the same, to the same extent that semiconductors are now, maybe. So... Why onions? Because blockchains are like onions, blockchains have layers. So you may have seen at least two or at least uh, one of these diagrams, maybe two, three, maybe four, if you, if you follow Bitcoin media way or blockchain media way much more than you should. But in general, we talk about kind of application stacks, we talk about the core, we talk about core technology, we talk about the networking layer, talk about different kinds of blockchains, smart contracts, dumb blockchains, Swiss Army Knife protocols, smart blockchains. Uh, we then talk about systems that, that live on top of these blockchains. We talk about smart contract programming languages. We talk about solutions for specific applications. We talk about privacy preserving layers. Then on top of that, we actually have the actual applications. And on top of that, we have the actual businesses that are finally going to make a single cent of money from the whole thing. So. There's lots of stuff to be done, lots of different, uh, different categories of work that need to be done. <laughs> then, uh, lots of categories of, wor of, of work to be done, lots of different people involved, academics, businessmen, developers, governments. Um, Marketing, sales, pro math, security auditing, just about everything. So this was what the industry looked like five years ago. I don't know how, how many people who, who were here were here five years ago. It was a very different place. It was about a few thousand people mostly hanging around internet forums. It was uh, some people were selling alpaca socks. <laughs> we had a bunch of gambling platforms. Um, we had physical coins that have Bitcoins inside of them. Bitmunchies, an actual st online store that sold a bunch of various kinds of food for Bitcoin. And a bunch of uh, more interesting stuff. <laughs> Here's where we are now, 2016. Microsoft, Azure, Go, Ethereum on Ubuntu. Deloitte to build Ethereum-based digital bank with New York City's consensus. Republic of Estonia e-residency partnership BitNation governance 2.0. Ethereum used for first paid energy trade using blockchain technology. UBS shedding a new light on blockchain experimentation. Possibilities for the US Postal Service, NASDAQ OMX. So from here to here, five years. So this is welcome to the speed of modern technological development. So first of all, what's the point? Even outside the context of crypto, in general, things of value in the world are becoming increasingly digital. So this is a chart of the euro money supply, so from 1998 to 2007. Now here it's put into different categories. Now physical currency out of that, currency in, in circulation, only a small portion. On top of that, M1, M2, M3, basically different categories of bank deposits, all of which are pretty much entirely stored virtually. So people sometimes talk about Bitcoin as if it's the first digital currency. Well, guess what? The euro is 90% a digital currency already. Domain names. So the, can, the ownership of the domain name privatejet.com literally costs more money than a private jet. 
here's another interesting example. Let's look at the top five instances of any kind of crowdsourced project funding. Crowdfunding, crowd sales, and anything in the general category. One of them, won't name the name, sold 60, 60 million digital tokens whose value is to pay for computational cycles in a, in a decentralized network. Crowd sale that happens two years ago, got a huge, huge pile of Bitcoin, ended up paying for pretty much all of Ethereum development. One of them, Star Citizen, $114 million. What, what were they crowdfunding? They were selling for $500 each virtual spaceships in the massively multiplayer online game that they're themselves developing. That's their, that's their current business model, $114 million. Pretty close to one billion Hong Kong. <laughs> so if Asia becomes like the sort of actual center of the world and the, and the definition of a billionaire starts shifting to like these, those currencies, then it's, it's, it's pretty impressive. And one of them, $160 million, sold tokens of a fully autonomous decentralized company that sits on top of the decentralized computer network. So there we have it, three out of five completely virtual objects. Our systems for dealing with these assets, unfortunately, they're often insecure, they're, they're interoperable, lack global usability, and they're pretty outdated. So 200,000 Comcast customers told to reset their passwords after their data got hacked and was offered for sale. App Store got shut down, bunch of customer details stolen. Incident in about five years ago where a major certificate authority got hacked and people basically were just some random person from Iran who managed to do it in something like 20 minutes. And it turns out that a whole bunch of like major websites are potentially compromised. So digital, state of digital security is uh, still, unfortunately, is still not very strong. The good news is, unlike with the case of physical security, we actually can do digital security much better. And we can even do it much more cheaply. So talking about smart contracts, the original analogy that, for, that Nick Sabo used for smart contracts when he came up with the concept was vending machines. So vending machines, they're kind of a smart contract implemented in hardware. You put, a, you, put a, you put a dollar in, there's a set of rules implemented in physical hardware that say when you put a dollar in, some bottle of some kind of a drink comes out. Making that vending machine, making it secure, it's expensive. And even still, vending machines don't have an infinite security. If you really want to, you can take a hammer and you can break it. In the digital world, making the virtual equivalent of a vending machine, number one, much cheaper. And number two, once you make it, it's pretty much unbreakable. So how can blockchains help? So there's uh, been a lot of interest in blockchain technology in the last year. Well, you may have seen this cover of The Economist, The Trust Machine. So people are starting to get the idea that blockchain technology are this kind of abstract thing. They can kind of make things more trustworthy in some sense that we uh, kind of don't fully understand. A lot of people have uh, gotten to the point of kind of hearing about it from the first time and, and, and getting the sense that it's somehow something that might end up uh, improving trust or, or reducing fraud in some sense or just kind of being part of the economy. But what does that mean? So what does the trust machine even mean? So in general, blockchains are a mechanism that allows you to run application logic. So and, and application logic can be different things. Could be the, law, the rules of a currency. Like, so you know, logic that says, if I have 50 units of some currency, I can transfer up to 50 units to some other account, but not more than 50 units. Could be the rules behind registering domain names, could be registering various other kinds of digital property, could be financial contracts, could be identity management. They allow, and they allow you to run this logic on a platform which is extremely robust, completely trustworthy, decentralized, thousands of computers. There's a strong guarantee that the platform is not going to, number one, arbitrarily change its functionality. Number two, once it realizes that the entire economy is dependent on it, it's not going to ra rack its prices up by a factor of 100 and extract monopoly rents. And number three, it's not going to shut down. So one, one testament to this, there is about, there's somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 blockchains running right now. Most of them aren't doing anything interesting at all. Most of them are just things that some guy on some internet forum spun up. And as long as at least one user somewhere continues to mine them, guess what? The blockchain continues to exist, even if the original developer completely forgot about it and wishes it was dead. So that's power of blockchain technology. 
disintermediation. So you can do sort of generalized kind of X without the X. If you're if the concept of Uber without the Uber, Facebook sign-in without the Facebook, banking without banks excites you, this is a technology for you. So <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's okay, you know, bankers can stay in banks, they're just going to be go visiting food banks. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> um, so, problem. Of course, one, one, one question people ask is, you know, okay, trust. Well, guess what? People already trust Microsoft, they trust Google, they trust the government. I mean, fortunately, making this uh, presentation in a country like Singapore where the government seems to broadly make sense. Last time I made the presentation, when I said, uh, back in Australia, when I said the sentence out loud, I recall people laughing. <laughs> um, blockchains are not, at least in the near, so blockchains are not about competing with them. They're about creating a low-cost alternative. So if you're looking for a if you're looking for a place where blockchain technology might apply, think of the places where sort of strong institutional trust anchors just don't exist at all, and it's going to be hard to create one because well nobody trusts anyone. So think of you know some country where the government and two other paramilitary groups are at war with each other. Who's going to be the bank? So. One sort of nice graph that I use to describe this is this sort of notion between kind of safety and investment or between sort of safety and the x-axis could be cost, could be social capital, could be a bunch of, could be regulation, could be a bunch of different things. So systems that are centralized in the developing world, developed world tends to already be safe, but they tend to have been expensive to build, to get up to that point. M of N systems, sort of decentralized systems right now, Practically speaking, they are still a bit less a bit less safe than that. There's still technological risks. There is still kind of user level security issues, but they're much cheaper. In other places, in many other places in the world, safety they have invested even more money than in that, in even more social capital than blockchains can provide. But the level of safety is much lower. So somewhere we have to find. There are a lot of places where there is potential, but the potential is basically getting to the same level of reliability that in many cases we have now, but much, much cheaper. Side benefits. Standardization. Blockchains are completely automated. So some people who are pushing blockchain technology are really basically just pushing automation. Global. You can use... Uh, send Bitcoins from Kyrgyzstan to Guatemala just as easily as you can send Bitcoins to your neighbor. Just exactly the same low fees, cheap. Um, f f the fees are somewhere between five to seven cents. Now that said, in the case of Bitcoin specifically, fees have been going up a bit lately, but I'll probably talk about that later in the governance section. Inter-application, interoperability. Applications on blockchains can talk to each other. And because of the way that smart contract immutability works, the interoperability is actually even more reliable than each individual, than the blockchain that the applications are relying on themselves. So useful in a bunch of different areas. So there's clearly a lot of potential. And, unfortunately, and ultimately, it is the job of a combination of blockchain enthusiasts, people in, people in suits, um, pe business people who hopefully won't be wearing suits because I think suits are stupid, and a, bunch of other, and a bunch of other groups to figure those areas out. But I think clearly we're getting there. So let's talk about decentralization. So blockchains are a decentralized technology. That's kind of the whole point. So just to sort of be a bit controversial here, scaling Bitcoin conference in Hong Kong last year, those of you who are kind of in the know probably know that, that thing on the left is a picture of the nine major groups of, nine of Bitcoin miners or Bitcoin mining pools. Together, they control about 80 or 90 percent of the Bitcoin network. On the right, I have the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Subcommittee. So have to sort of think exactly what, first of all, what exactly what level of decentralization are you getting here? Is it necessarily even just a decentralization by itself, or is a decentralization coupled together with something else? Is decentralization just the number of people involved in making a decision, or are there also other factors like how hard, how easy, or how hard is it for the people to coordinate? Do the people in these communities? in these uh, committees have a sort of history and a culture of coordinating? Are there social expectations that they can or cannot do certain things? 
Realistically, even though these nine miners create all the create most of the blocks, if they were to start printing 100 bitcoins for themselves every 10 minutes, well, my bitcoin client would just reject their blocks. So their power isn't unlimited. So decentralization can mean many things. But at the end of the day, from a technological standpoint, obviously there's still one of the sort of interesting research direction of figuring out if we actually can create blockchain protocols that are more, more decentralized. I think it's possible. We just have to switch from proof of work to proof of stake and do a bunch of other things. So some, of course, argue that blockchain, that this is terrible. Blockchains are a threat to the distributed future of the internet. And what does this bright person from the Peer to Peer Foundation say? We should switch to the distributed structure of servers. So just to sort of give a bit of context here, before blockchain technology existed, there were, was an established community of people who were trying to create kind of more decentralized applications. And this is something that people have been wanting for kind of if, for quite a long time. They don't like the idea of like one company sort of be kind of like being like Facebook and controlling the entire network effect and being able to extract huge monopoly rents from that. Technology they were using before is basically they were saying, let's still have an application based on you know, users connecting to servers. Difference is anyone can set up their own server, and people may even set up their own server. And the system, there's a protocol by which these systems can talk to each other. So this person is a bit bearish on blockchain technology for these use cases, thinks we should stick with the server model. So I think he's completely wrong. First reason is, the, the one major platform that took on this model was uh, Diaspora. So this is a sort of social network that tried to compete with Facebook back in 2010. So this is, is it really pre-Bitcoin, but in some sense it is sort of pre-blockchain decentralization. Turns out, first of all, now in general, I am kind of fairly bearish on freedom blocks. I'm fairly bearish on anything that calls itself the Bitcoin computer. I'm not... Even, you know, any project that tries to call itself, you know, the Ethereum computer Quite, po quite possibly as well. Any projects that uh, might, su might succeed, but in general, my viewpoint is users do not want to maintain their own servers. So this uh, manual Ortega says barriers of entry are associated only with knowledge and the cost of infrastructure are very low. Well, yeah, you know, of course, you buy a, buy a freedom box for $100, you have your own server. Problem is, in reality, it's not just about buying your own server. It's about making sure your box is connected to the internet 100% of the time, making sure that the internet connection is robust, making sure that you know, if, if it crashes, it, it, it starts up again quickly. So a whole bunch of sort of maintenance tasks that practically speaking, people really don't want to do. And the thing is, you know, people, for, for myself personally, all I have is a laptop. That laptop for maybe somewhere between 12 and 12 and 16 hours a day, that laptop is turned off, or at least suspended. So, so that server model, don't think it works well. And ultimately, server, I think users will probably want things that they can just use off of their existing computers. So if people can't kind of maintain their own servers themselves, what do they do? Well, they just kind of use third-party services. Now the advocates say this is fine because while well, these services can talk to each other, it's a common protocol. This ignores reality for two reasons. One of them is, in practice, it still ends up being pretty centralized. So in the case of Diaspora, there's one of these kind of centralized servers and called joindiaspora.com, has about 49% of the market share. And the second piece of history that people need to remember is this sort of embrace, extend, and extinguish concept. If all you have is an open standard, then what you have is a standard where if one particular group manages to get market share, now, of course, in the case of diaspora, all these people ideologically believe in decentralization. Chances are joindiaspora.com is not going to do anything evil. But if we're talking about sort of mainstream adoption, then practically speaking, if one major player gets market share, then that player can eventually start making their own extensions to try and, quote, improve user experience, make those extensions proprietary over time, and then eventually deliberately make themselves incompatible with the network and they'll force everyone to go with them. So, my opinion, not long-term stable. And in my opinion, one of the interesting things about blockchain technology specifically is that it's actually a kind of open standard that forces you to really rigidly stick to it and not make any kind of extensions. If you, make an, if you create a blockchain client that, 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 that extends itself, that's called a hard fork. And guess what? You're going to fly off the network and nobody's going to want to use your system again. 
So it's a system that does use a very powerful kind of force of inertia to actually make sure that the thing remains open and that the thing remains standardized. So what is decentralization? Kind of hard to say. I mean, first of all, there's obviously these sort of different uh, debates on how to, how to measure it. But then, you know, there's also sort of graphs like this. People talk about centralized, decentralized, distributed. In my opinion, this characterization is completely useless because nobody really agrees on what decentralized and distributed mean. So I prefer my own, my own characterization. Three-dimensional compass. Number one, politically centralized, politically decentralized. Is it controlled by one company or is it actually a system that's kind of controlled by a lot of people together? So then architecturally centralized. Is it run on one server or is it run on a, bunch of, on a whole bunch of computers that talk to each other? And finally, is it logically centralized? Does it feel kind of like sort of one central thing or does the view kind of feel sort of more, more distributed where everyone kind of sees it in a different way? So you can have com different combinations of this. So for example, there's lots of major gaming companies that use torrent networks, which are architectural or decentralized, as a way of spreading updates to, the, to, the, uh, to their games that they're making to their users. Politically centralized, they're the ones pushing the clients, they have authority over the network, but architecturally speaking, it's very distributed and, again, and it has efficiency gains from that. Look at something like a lot of political systems tends to be pretty decentralized, voting is pretty decentralized, everyone can vote. Mechanism that enforces it, it's pretty centralized. Logically decentralized, so torrent networks, logically decentralized. Nobody even sees what all of the files are, everyone has a different view. There's not really sort of much coordination and consistency in them. And if all you want to do is transfer files around, that's perfectly fine. Blockchains are logically centralized. There's one view, it pretends to be a single computer. You know, that's, we call Ethereum the world computer. And I argue logical centralization is actually a good thing, and it's precisely the re a major reason why blockchains are such an easy platform for people to develop on, and why they've been kind of successful in ways that previous forms of decentralization, even if they may have been perfectly ad 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 adequate, have failed. So, by the way, just as a quick aside, People sometimes uh, argue that you need proof of work is basically the only way to get decentralization, the only way to get sort of truly secure blockchains in some sense. Completely false. So proof of work is one kind of security mechanism. There are obviously other ways to run blockchains. You can have proof of work, you can have proof of stake. You can eat, there's even this concept of consortium blockchains where basically you choose like some like 20 or 40 like known people from around the world, give each one of them a node, have a kind of blockchain between them. That's perfectly fine. And I would argue that that's pretty tamper proof as well because convincing all of those people to go along with a tampering attempt is realistically also not, it's, it's hard to say that it's that much more difficult than convincing these people to all collude with each other. Um, whether you're talking about the miners or the Bank of England Monetary Policy Subcommittee. So, Blockchains and standardization. So, let's see. Standardization, so problem that happens in the real world. Very often, people want to have, you know, there's a bunch of standards. People want to sort of make a standard that covers all, you, all use cases. So, problem is, of course, nobody has the ability to actually manage to do it. So I would argue that if you want to sort of create a good open standard, there are kind of nice properties that you want your standard to have. So you know you want it to be sort of reliable, you want people to kind of perceive it as being neutral, and you want it to sort of be perceived as being kind of independent and not controlled by any single commercial or political entity. And you want it to be difficult to make to do this kind of embrace and extend attack off of it. So I would argue the reason why a lot of blockchain plays actually are standardization plays. And that's perfectly fine because blockchains do happen to have the side benefit of actually having all these nice properties. So Let's talk about government applications. 2011, the primary government application of blockchain technology was making government's lives harder. <laughs> so you may have heard of Black Market Reloaded, which is a totally legit market. You may have heard of Dark Leaks, anonymously selling information, a bunch of other ano anonymous marketplaces. Basically, if you were in the government in 2011 to 2013, you saw blockchain technology, and chances are you were looking at this. 2014. So this is the place where sort of blockchain developers decided to sort of take the more Canadian route and try to kind of apologize for the first three years of the 
blockchain industry as they tried to basically do the classic signaling thing and got a bunch of advisors to make them from from securities commissions to make themselves look more impressive and look and look more legit. So BitPay, Valrum, probably a bunch of other examples, way too many to list. That's now here we are in 2016. So this is another one of those slides where I have to kind of carefully lay things out hexagonally because there's just so much impressive stuff happening. UK government awarding 250,000 pounds for a uh, <coughs> Ethereum prototype. So this is the company called Tremonex, which is doing essentially a kind of fiat current, a currency backed digital token. Russia's National Settlement Depository testing and e-voting system. Proof of identity on Ethereum. This is a kind of link, bet a link between sort of Estonian e-residency and uh, the Ethereum blockchain. Credits are doing some kind of KYC blockchain. Looks like KYC blockchain is the new buzzword these days. Um, Ukraine government doing something. Postal Service has a nice report. It mentions Ethereum a couple times, therefore it's good. <laughs> so it's changing. Now the question is, of course, what is this going to look like in 2020? Now, quite possibly, I mean, I hope there's going to be so much interesting stuff happening that each individual box is going to be less than one pixel and you're not going to be able to read any of it. So, in general, stuff to keep in mind. Number one, government services are services too. Stuff the government does is also stuff. It's part of the economy. There's no reason why, in general, the kinds of things that the government is involved in should benefit from blockchain applications any less than the private sector. So governments may trust themselves, but do they trust each of their own employees? So I think inside of large institutions, there's still trust problems. Inside of, between different government departments, quite possibly, between, uh, even inside of large corporations, some of them are, just, are actually structured in a kind of fairly sort of globally distributed way. They might not even have perfect trust between themselves. Third point, a bit, a bit controversial, but important, I think, a lot of people are scared of uh, blockchain technology because the major news items that they saw was 2014, Bitcoin exchange called Mt. Gox collapsed, and it turns out that it was like missing $500 million of its depositors' Bitcoin. And uh, I would argue the Mt. Gox collapse is actually an argument in favor of decentralized crypto technology and not against it. So here's why. Mt. Gox, first of all, it's a Bitcoin exchange. Sure, it has connection to Bitcoin, which is a blockchain. Fortunately, we don't have anyone seriously saying that it's the blockchain. But so, the but the, practically speaking, uh, aside from that, it's a centralized service. It's a it's a thing run by one company, or or it's a company run by one guy who is absolutely not transparent. People sent their bitcoins into it. They pretty much had no had to blindly trust it. So, it's the exact opposite of what we're trying to do here. There are actually possibilities to use blockchain and crypto technology to do things like, number one, have an exchange make, create cryptographic proofs every second, proving that it continues to be solvent and it has all the Bitcoins that it needs to line up with, its, with the deposits. Number two, you could even sort of de partially decentralize the sort of crypto exchange business entirely. 95%, at least 90, 90 to 95% of losses from exchanges are actually cryptocurrency losses. So a thing that you can do is sort of separate the market in half, where you have an exchange that where all it does is it issues a token backed by some fiat currency. So the only thing you're trusting them with is the fiat currency. Then you have a decentralized blockchain-based exchange between you know, dollar tokens or, or you know, Hong Kong dollar tokens, Singapore dollar tokens, say, euro tokens, and Ether, Bitcoin, whatever else you want to buy. Then decentralized exchange, keep it really trustworthy, you don't need to trust anyone. Only the fiat currency part has some trust component, but because that's 20 times smaller, you've reduced the trust risk by about 95%. So there actually are possibilities to use these crypto and smart contract technologies to recreate a lot of these financial systems in ways that you don't even need to sort of shuffle the trust around. You literally shuffle the trust around to the point where it just disappears. There's nothing that needs to be trusted because it's because the, the assets are literally directly under the control of computer programs that everyone can see. So that's not the, that's one one example. Another example is uh, quite possibly uh, something like. Uh, in general, investments ranging from crowdfunding to sort of VC investment don't need to give don't need to give people all the money immediately. 
could give it to them in tranches, could put it into a smart contract. Smart contract gives it out on a schedule and it has some rules that say if certain conditions aren't satisfied, then the money stops. So lots of possibilities. So first of all, in general, many governments, and I've talked to a lot of them personally, they're perfectly fine with blockchain technology. You actually be surprised. They're even perfectly fine with the concept of decentralization. If Quite often, if it's cheaper they act and, and more efficient and it provides what they want, they actually are willing to go for it. Last point, scalability matters. So in general, blockchains right now, Bitcoin could do three to seven transactions a second, Ethereum could do 15. If you want to create a system that processes all stock transfers in a country, you might need something like 10 to 100,000 transactions a second. So us technology people still have a long way to go. Talk about security. So, quick tour through Bitcoin land. In June 2011, Bitcoin talk member All in Vain lost 25,000 Bitcoins after an unknown intruder somehow gained access to his computer. The attacker was able to access All in Vain's wallet dad file and quickly empty out the wallet, either by sending a transaction from the computer itself or uploading it. Guy hacked into his computer, he lost $500,000. Okay, so hacking is a problem. Well, let's make your let's try and store your passwords and accounts in a way that's so so secure that even you can't access it. Bitcoin developer Stefan Thomas had three backups of his wallet. It encrypted a USB stick, a Dropbox account, and a VirtualBox virtual machine. However, he managed to erase two of them and forget the password to the third, forever losing access to 7,000 BTC. <coughs> and there's a bunch more. If you read this particular article, there's like another four examples. Now, of course, centralization itself has its flaws, Mt. Gox. Now, that's about money. Now, let's look at Ethereum land, smart contracts programming. Here is someone trying to make a, a, a sort of toy decentralized casino on the Ethereum blockchain. Of course, any kind of, any kind of decentralized casino needs a random number generator. So the guy figured, OK, I am going to just write the function that just generates random numbers. I'm going to write it, put it into smart contract code. The thing that the per, per guy probably didn't realize is that no, putting your random number generator seed in a function and calling the function private doesn't mean that it's private. Guys, it's running on a public blockchain. So what happened is some guy basically managed to kind of sort of simul, pr, simulate transactions on his local machine over and over again and kind of pretends to run the transaction, see what the results would be, and then eventually published, you know, kept on publishing transactions only when his simulations showed those transactions were going to win. And so he managed to drain this casino of pretty much all of its money. So that's a sort of pitfall of smart contract programming. Here's another one. Got an application. That application has uh, basically has the job of kind of paying, it, paying out a bunch of people in sequence. In this particular case, you might notice there's a different. There's two variables here. There's payout cursor underscore ID underscore, and there's payout cursor underscore ID with no underscore. If you don't look at that carefully, you might not realize that those are two different variables. Payout cursor underscore ID underscore gets incremented every time the money gets sent. The other variable does not. So the contract looks like it pays everyone. In reality, it just pays the first person over and over again. <laughs> So an obvious and yeah, I mean, the, and the first person who participated in this particular contract is totally not the creator of the contract who totally did not do this deliberately. And more. So trust for utopia is a bit harder than it seems. So the question is, how do we avoid this without bringing back this? How do we avoid sort of the sort of security issues of decentralization without, but without doing it in a stupid way that just gives us centralized gateways all over again? I think we can. Now, finally, talk about governance. So, back in 2013, the and you know back in the original days, the intention was for these systems to be kind of completely apolitical systems that had no chal governance challenges whatsoever, because you have a protocol. Ah, oh, Satoshi dreamed up Bitcoin. The protocol is perfect. It needs no changes whatsoever. And all the innovation has to, gets to happen on top. Simple, right? So back then, the major criticism was basically that, well, maybe according to Yanis Varoufakis, depoliticized currencies were just were not capable of having, having monetary policies that would, that, that would be economically optimal under many different kinds of circumstances. So, he thought that the, the, the decentralized uh, or depoliticized currency could exist. He just didn't think that it would work well. Here's the problem. In here's the issue that happened in reality. So on top, now this is all in the context of the Bitcoin block size debate. 
Andreas Antonopoulos, I believe this is called a Mexican standoff. So just to give a, big, a bit of a background here, basically there's sort of two strategies right now to trying to kind of increase Bitcoin scalability. One of them is this approach called segregated witness. Another one is this approach called basically a hard fork that just sort of pushes up the, the maximum size of a block. So theoretically, you can use both of them together. There's one, there's one political party called Core. There's one political party called Classic. Core prefers the, the SegWit approach. Classic prefers just pushing the, pushing the limit up. So Core are, is the group that basically controls the development process. But over here, what do we have? Basically, one of the mining pools refuses to kind of approve the uh, segregated witness unless the code for the, for the hard fork to increase the limit gets released first. And Andrea is just calling this a kind of Mexican standoff and that you have these sort of two groups that are kind of standing off against each other and they're at this point kind of stuck in an impasse. So I went to Wikipedia, looked up, looked up Mex the term Mexican standoff. In popular use, the term Mexican standoff is sometimes used to refer to confrontations in which neither opponent appears to have a measurable advantage. Historically, as many commentators have used the term to reference the Soviet Union-United States nuclear confrontation during the Cold War, specifically to the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Now, if this isn't politics, I don't really know what is. So. Basically, fact is, these systems do have political challenges. They are not just kind of magic things in a, in a box that are sort of completely immune to kind of human social political constraints. And what, what sort of computer geeks have lately been realizing is that basically, no, just the simple fact that your institutions are written in code doesn't mean that you get to escape the category of human social process that we describe with the word politics. So it's harder. There's also, now, we also have this interesting concept called DAOs. So one of them just uh, got, got $150 million. DAOs are kind of interesting challenges in governance is that you actually use sort of smart contract code in order to kind of encode the rules under which assets are controlled. Really interesting model. Now, that said, it's still a very early one. So the first DAO turns out that the code in, that, in the DAO has some kind of sort of incentive compatibility ish issues. And it turns out that the governance algorithm isn't, isn't quite perfect. And there are some concerns that sort of bias it toward voting yes, even for bad proposals. And so people are kind of, right now, the project is kind of slowing down so that it sort of, so that it kind of has some other time to basically upgrade its code to at least, get, at least solve those issues before it really starts voting on proposals. So governance challenges in DAOs, another category of governance challenges, they're still happening. This is something that hopefully will get resolved in the, in the next couple of years, but ultimately it's going to have, have to iterate. Decentralized companies on the blockchain are an experiment. And you know, realistically, I think we're going to see many of them. Or I think we're going to see people trying lots of different approaches. Some of them will fail. Some of them will succeed. Could be very interesting. So blockchains are the future. So the goal, at least for myself, is think of it as a kind of decentralized operating system. Think of it as a kind of base layer platform that lets you do, theoretically, everything that you can do with applications today with minimal losses to scalability, latency, privacy, but with the gain of decentralization and cryptographic security. So create a kind of platform that lets people sort of choose the security trade-offs that they want, that lets people create tries to be as much of a kind of in almost invisible, invisible layer uh, uh, as possible, but provide security at the same time. This obviously takes first, right, not, not this kind of DLS. Obviously it takes scalability concerns, obviously it takes sort of privacy challenges, and ultimately building the applications. So stage one is building the applications. That's happening right now. Ethereum has about 220 of them. Stage two, applications need to get actual users. And of course, need more pandas. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>